Hello everyone, welcome to the final video of my Dark Souls beginner walkthrough series. So in this video, it shouldn't take very long to complete the game. I just have a couple things to grab and a couple things to show because these are the things that you're going to want to think about before you move on into New Game Plus because you won't be able to get them until your whole game cycle is over again at this point. So, first thing I'm showing you around, I'm in the Ulusil Township dungeon area. If you look down, there's that doorway. You would run up some stone stairs, then run up these wood stairs, and you would run up over here. And I think you'll see where I'm at once I get to here. You can see this is where you roll off, and over there's the Mimic with the Crest Key that I already picked up and everything. I used a Lloyd's Talisman to not have to kill it. And then over here's this wooden section, so you should have an okay idea of where we're at. And in here is a Light Illusion Wall that I didn't get last time. Now this item really isn't crucial, so if you don't want to come down here, it's really nothing. It's a Red Titanite Chunk. But if you're using fire weapons and you don't want to have to farm, that's a red titanite chunk you don't have to go farm for. But the Kiln of the First Flame has a infinite source of red titanite chunks by killing, I think, the Great Sword um, Black Knight, but I'm not certain. So, anyway. I wanted to grab that because I said I was missing something, and that is a kind of hidden room area that, you know, I want to show. It's kind of cool. There is another use for that light illusion wall. Only two spots in the DLC, but that's the other spot. So what we're going to go do is we're going to go talk to the cleric chick, Rhea of Thorland. She's up here if you haven't bought all her miracles. Now, in my spare time of getting everything I wanted to get before New Game Plus, I was going to say, hey, go up to her and buy all her miracles and then kill her. Because you're not going to need her once you have all her miracles. She also drops her talisman, which is a really good faith scaling talisman. So if you're a cleric person, that actually is probably something you want to go get because it's really, really good. So, um... I was going to show that, but I end up, like, killing everybody and securing the area, and she's not here. This is also where I showcase some weapons, so that you can see um, what some of the boss weapons look like. I wanted to make sure this was all safe, so I'm not running around showing weapons and I get hit by something, so... Everything in here is pretty easy to kill. One arrow each pretty much takes care of all that. Now, if you haven't bought all of Rhea's miracles, she's up here at the altar praying, but for me, she's not because I bought everything. Now, the little cut in the video that just happened there was because I forgot that she goes hollow once you buy all her stuff, so I had to look up where she went because usually I end up killing her right after I buy her stuff, but that wasn't the case this time. So... She goes to Duke's Archives, and we'll go there, we'll take care of her, and we'll get her talisman that way. If you kill her after you buy all her miracles, you should be able to get the Pendant, which isn't anything special, it's actually an item with no use. I believe you get it if you kill her right up here, if not, I know you get it if Petrus kills her and then you kill Petrus, but we killed Petrus so that she wouldn't die so that we could buy her miracles, and I went and did all that between videos, so sorry if you wanted to see that part, but unfortunately she's not there anymore. So, back to the rest of this. Um, a plus 10 sword will make the Abyss Greatsword, which is in my right hand. It's basically Artorius' sword again with a different moveset, and a catalyst, unupgraded, could be just the normal sorcerer's catalyst, can make the Tin Dark Moon catalyst and the Manus catalyst. The Tin Dark Moon catalyst is a good catalyst if you are a cleric that wants to use sorcery. You have to use, you, you have to have the intelligence 
to cast the sorcery. So it's not like if a spell requires 12 intelligence to cast, if you have 12 faith, you can cast it. You still need the 12 intelligence, but what it means is if you have, say, 50 faith for a cleric build, and you happen to have 12 intelligence and want to cast a low-level sorcery, then it will scale based off of your 50 faith instead of your 12 intelligence. So it's kind of neat, but it's very impractical for anybody, because probably nobody's going to build a build like that. But the other thing is Manus's Catalyst, which acts like a giant axe on top of it being a catalyst. Unfortunately, it can only do the axe slam. There's no other moves. You can't backstab or anything with it. And its primary function is a catalyst. It halves the amount of castings you have for a sorcery so that you can do extra damage. It works like the tin crystallization catalyst, but for lower intelligence people and for um, people that want like melee use out of their catalyst. So the Abyss Greatsword is pretty cool. You do a lot of flips and a lot of spins and stuff that Artorius did in his battle against you. And actually, that becomes a common theme for Artorius' stuff in Dark Souls 2 and 3. They tend to use the movesets from that Abyss Greatsword rather than Artorius' swords in this game. So, um... That's what you're more likely going to see. So if you've ever seen people fool around with Dark Souls weapons in any game, and they mentioned Artorius' greatsword, you'll probably see a move like that and the two-handed flip overhead slam. So just to test what the other swords do and look like. Um, they basically all look the same, except, you know, this one's like the purest form. It's a bright silver blade, and it's pretty clean. The Abyss Greatsword is like half decayed and covered in black goo. And then the Cursed Artorius Greatsword is like a black blade and a kind of maybe chrome outline. And really the main difference is that it says this Ar Greatsword of Artorius is used to hunt like things like Dark Wraiths and stuff. Um, I don't really know of it actually doing something like that. But maybe against four kings or dark wraiths, it's pretty powerful. The cursed one can attack ghosts, and the abyss great sword is just a really cool sword. So, anyway, that's the showcase of weapons for now. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna go to Duke's archives, which is where the cleric Rhea of Thorland lady is, and. She's in the dungeon area, actually. She's in a private cell where you get the extra cell key. Not the, not the big cell that Logan sits in, but the extra cell. So, she is in there. We're going to have to go there, and we'll find her hollowed in there. The rest of this is just me looking this up to confirm, because I thought she might have been in Tomb of the Giants. But she ends up being in Duke's archives. And so that's me looking it up. So this part is just running back to the prison cell area. I'll speed it up. So just in case you happen to forget how to get up there. You want to run up the staircase. And run up it again. So I get to like the third floor. You'll run past a channeler. You run down this hallway here. A big ladder you'll have to go down here, and then you've got to fight a couple snake men and any crystal dudes who happen to follow you down here. So that's unfortunately what I have to do since I ran past everything. But once that's taken care of, this area should be pretty safe. Just don't rest at the bonfire down here because you'll be stuck. So what you want to do, it's not that cell, it's this next cell here. This is the cell where you open it and you're like, huh, there's really nothing in here but the key. Well, she's back there. She's really weak. She's going to attack you, but she doesn't seem to do any miracles against me. She just runs at me and tries to punch me. And I, too, hit her. So she shouldn't be that strong. I mean, she even says in the game that all she's got to offer are miracles and apparently nothing offensive. 
Except for maybe Wrath of the Gods. I don't know if she uses Wrath of the Gods, but there's a very high possibility that she could because that's like the only offensive thing she knows, I think, or at least is willing to sell to you. So the Ivory Talisman scales an A in Faith, which is really high scaling for Faith. It says you can only get it if you're a female cleric, which even if you were a female cleric, you would not get this talisman. You only get it from Rhea if you kill her. So you have to do her quest line. If Petrus kills her, I don't even know if you get the talisman. I know that you get the pendant that way, or at least I'm pretty certain you get the pendant that way. You might not even get her talisman that way. So you can look it up on the wiki. It'll say, hey, if Petrus kills her, then this happens. Sometimes if you kill Petrus to save her, she just comes up missing because the game thinks that she's supposed to go missing, but or she's supposed to die, but she's not because you killed him. But maybe you were too late. That was actually the Dark Moon bow, which you get from a bow at plus 10. Could be a short bow, could be a long bow, could be the black bow of Ferris. If you don't like that bow and you'd rather make the Dark Moon bow out of it, you can. I'd advise against it because it is like the best dexterity scaling bow. But the Dark Moon bow is a short bow, fires pretty fast, and has some intelligence scaling. So a magic user, it's basically a magic bow for you. Well, so another thing you're going to want to do on this quick checklist of things is come to this dude, the exotic armor salesman, and buy his armor. Buy the... you should have the Gwendolyn set available, which is the Dark Sun stuff. Crown of the Dark Sun, I think, Robe of the Dark Sun. It's like the Dark Sun set. It's Gwendolyn stuff that he was wearing during that boss battle. That's in the Tomb of the Giants video if you don't remember who he is. Um, and then there's Artorius' stuff. Of course, he's from the DLC. And I'll just equip it all so you can kind of see what it looks like. Actually, it's Moonlight. Sorry. Moonlight Wastecloth. Moonlight this. It's for Dark Sun Gwendolyn. And... It'll tell you that Gwendolyn, since the power of the moon, I guess, is feminine in this game, or according to this game's lore, it says that Gwendolyn, since he was frail, was actually raised as a daughter, which is kind of weird, but that's why everything looks like a dress instead of, like, cool robes or something. And then you've got Artorius' stuff, which is all degraded because he was consumed by the abyss. I'm somewhat disappointed that this isn't like a restored Artorius' armor, like a brand new clean version, because Ornstein's armor is clean, but it kind of makes more sense that Artorius' would be degraded. So, eh, anyway. I also went ahead between videos, I have 52,000 souls and I leveled up a few times because I went farming for Titanite slabs, it took a while, and... I got lots of souls from it, but um, I, I got some Titanite slabs to upgrade my armor. You don't have to do that. And I also upgraded, um, actually I didn't upgrade a shield or a sword or anything. Well, I did upgrade a couple weapons, but that was just to make the boss weapons. So that's nothing really important. And let's see. So I have 18 intelligence and 18 faith because I've been leveling those up. So that means pretty much everything except for the great sword of Artorius I can actually use. And that's pretty cool. Um, and that's the normal great sword, not the cursed one. That's pretty cool. At this point, if you have almost 20 intelligence and 20 faith, you should be able to use just about everything. And most miracles and spells that are like low entry, just useful stuff you should be able to use, which is pretty cool. And now what we're gonna do, I know I was just at Ulisil Township, and I don't know why I didn't think about this when I was here, but, um, we're gonna go kill Hawkeye Goff. And it's kinda weird, it's like, hey, he was really nice, he was helping us out, why are we gonna go kill him? Well, that's because he has an armor set that is unique to him, and you can only get it by killing him, just like we killed Kirin and got her stuff. So, um, yeah, we're gonna go up there and we're gonna kill him. He's not too tough, although according to 
the wiki and stuff if you are not making any noise, so you're wearing the Slumbering Dragon Crest Ring or using Hush. And if you're using sorcery and spells and stuff, he shouldn't be able to detect you. But I tried it, and he does detect me. I have to, like, roll away a little bit. So, I don't really see what they were talking about. Maybe I'm just doing it wrong. He is blind, so the game says, or really the wiki says, that because he's blind, he can only hear you. If you're muffled, he should really forget where you are really easy. I tried doing some magic. I found that my Great Chaos Fireball was doing way more than any sorcery. And you can wear sorcery boosting gear and stuff. Of course, I'm not a sorcerer, but I didn't expect my stuff to do, like, 49 damage like it was doing to him. And I was expecting it to do, like, maybe 100 or so. So, I personally think that Fireball or Great Chaos Fireball or whatever is going to do more damage than magic or anything. Unless you're a really high-level intelligence sorcerer. But, for me, I was doing like 400 and something because of Great Chaos Fireball, and then I was doing like 49 with sorcery boosting gear and everything, trying to uh, damage him that way and compensate for my low intelligence, but more castings, and it totally didn't really work. So, um, honestly, if you run out of Great Chaos Fireball, which you probably will, you can just switch to melee. But yeah, 483 and then a 230 burn on him on top of that. If you can get that to happen every time, you're going to do tons of damage. That's over 700 damage for one casting. And I have four castings of that, so that's pretty cool. You can see he's looking at me, and he's like coming after me. He doesn't really forget where you are unless he attacks at you and you dodge him like a few times, then he'll forget. So this beginning part is me trying to figure out what the heck they're talking about, because obviously he hasn't forgotten where I am. He's still looking for me right now. So you'll see what my strategy ends up being when I do get to him, but yeah, it he doesn't really seem to forget. Not right now. But if you run up here, see he's trying to attack I say screw this I'm just gonna dodge him it can be a pain to try and dodge him he did a ton of damage to me but now since I'm silent he seems to have forgotten where I was so it's like he has to attack you and then he'll forget where you are if he doesn't get to do the attack he'll just be like perpetually locked on you maybe I didn't run far enough away but I'm finding this to be a much better strategy, except for the fact that that fireball didn't do anything to him. But yeah, I'm wearing some stuff that's supposed to boost my sorcery, and I'm using Manus's Catalyst, because that's supposed to do more damage. And so I do Great Soul Arrow, which should be pretty okay for damage, probably like 100 or 150 and I try it on him here, and it's like, boom, 42, not even 49. And now he's pissed, and I'm like, wow, that sucks. I know I could do much more damage by just attacking him with my sword. So I go back to my shield, and eventually you're going to want to have a Dragon Crest shield, probably fully leveled up for max stability, or a Black Knight shield, because the final boss uses fire, so now that I'm thinking about that, I'm going to make that little side note, but I'm going to switch to the Dragon Crest Shield, because I'll just have that for later then. And yeah, I seem to just find that dodging a couple attacks and then coming in and doing a power attack, 191, that's not 400-something, so maybe my Pyromancy Flame would be better, so maybe... If you go to do this, try using Fireball, or Great Fireball, or Great Chaos Fireball, or whatever, to do damage instead. Maybe you have more attunement slots, try Combustion, but it seems like he's weak to fire, or at least he's just not super resistant against it, because it seems like 
that just did a ton of damage compared to what a good fully leveled up sword is doing to him right now. If you can hit him and do that jumping attack, you do like 60 more damage instead of just a normal power attack. But it's kind of hard to hit him because he moves around, so I try to hit him with more jumps, but I think I just end up switching to a normal power attack after a while. But you can see he hits a few times, and then he's like, huh, where'd he go? And then you can get close to him and try and aim, and he turned on me. So it can be a pain trying to do that. I keep going for it because I'm like, oh, I just missed it. I'll get it next time, and then I'll get it next time. And I make the battle run just a little longer than it probably should. So, that was a complete miss. That body slam attack is pretty hard to dodge. I just happened to not be in his way. But he did the backwards body slam, and that got me. So, yeah. I just focus on hitting him with the power attacks. 20,000 souls, Goff's armor special to him so you'll never have to do that again if you don't like killing him and now I have 72,000 souls which is pretty good that's a couple levels I think and so now I'll reattune flash sweat because that's a pyromancy that reduces the amount of fire damage that you'll receive since the final boss does fire damage, that's really nice to have. So I got everything attuned and equipped the way I want it again. After all that. And the Guardian Soul. You might have picked that up. Well, you did pick that up when you killed the Sanctuary Guardian. There's nothing you can do with that, unfortunately. You think, oh, Guardian Soul, it's a boss soul, I can do something awesome with it. There are two things you can do with it. You can crush it and get 12,000 souls, or you can go to Frampton and feed it to him and get 10,000 souls. So just crush it. It's an easy 12,000 souls. I think the Sanctuary Guardian gives you like 30 or 40,000 for defeating it, which basically means you get 52,000 instead, if it was 40,000 or whatever, so... Anyway, that's really the only use for it. Um, I end up leveling Endurance some more, but you might want to level up Attunement if you're going to be using spells more. Try thinking about what kind of character your character wants to be in the next game cycle. Like, you did this night playthrough, that's cool. You're always going to be good with a sword and shield, because you've built that character like that. So decide maybe what you want to do in the next game cycle. If you want to do magic, it would be wise to find a character that is going to use a sword and shield, but is also going to apply to magic. So maybe you wear some lighter armor, maybe you use a lighter shield, but maybe a heavier sword, or maybe use the same sword and apply magic to it or something. Find something that'll work with your build, but that you can alter your guy into. So like, my guy, if I was going to do something, he's got 18 intelligence and 18 faith, I might go more cleric, like, I might get into healing miracles and lightning miracles and all of that instead of pyromancy. I mean, I kind of built my character to do anything at any point. I wanted to have some intelligence to cast some of the sorceries in case I needed them, and I wanted to have some faith to cast some of the miracles if I needed them. I didn't really need them with this guy for this time, but I will say in later game cycles, healing is going to be harder. So yeah, your 20 flasks right now, they're really helpful, you have an abundant supply, but in New Game Plus or Plus 2 or Plus 3, Flasks are not really going to be enough, and you're going to have to start probably relying more on miracles to heal you, like heal, medium heal, great heal excerpt, or great heal. Um, each one of those goes up in higher faith, so if healing is going to be a concern, if you're like, man, 
I'm gonna save the flasks for only boss fights, but for healing and combat and stuff during the game while I'm running around, I want miracles, then you might want to level up some faith. But those are just some ideas. You can really build whatever character you want. In terms of characters in Dark Souls, honestly, I had more fun when I restarted from scratch every single time. Rather than go into New Game Plus and try to rebuild a new character from my other character who wasn't built to be anything but what he's built like, then it was kind of hard for me to take a cleric that I had so much fun doing cleric stuff with who was super high strength and then switch him into like an acrobatic ninja character who's not getting any scaling from his strength. It, it like it's a lot of leveling and stuff and I couldn't really find a hybrid that I liked so I just like starting from scratch in this game. In Dark Souls 2 and 3 it's more forgiving because you can respect your characters so subsequent playthroughs is more advised because you can get in addition to the normal stuff, in Dark Souls 2 you can get new things in your next game cycle, and same in Dark Souls 3, but in 2 a little bit more so. Also new things happen in Dark Souls 2 in New Game Plus and beyond. There's more invaders, or there's different types of enemies, so um, they really encourage a New Game Plus or higher cycle in that game. And in both games, as long as you're within matchmaking range, which in Dark Souls 3 it meant as long as you have a password with a friend, you can still summon each other regardless of how strong you are. Pretty much. In Dark Souls 2, the matchmaking ranges just got so high it didn't even matter. In Dark Souls 3, they level your character up or down to matchmake with your friend so that you can actually stand a chance. Anyway, um, I was looking at a piece of paper. I wrote down some notes for this video. I mentioned the Obsidian Greatsword that you get from cutting off Calamite's tail. And the game tells you that it's a great axe. It kind of looks like a great axe. It swings slower than a great sword. And really kind of has more, I guess, choppy attacks. But its special thing is this power attack this big cool area of effect fire blast it's pretty cool but you consume about 50 durability per use so it'd be more fun in pvp the weapon also doesn't scale with any particular stat so if you're trying to build a character to use it there's really no building it does some damage you can reinforce it maybe but then once it's fully reinforced it doesn't do any more damage I also have the Large Divine Ember and the Occult Ember, or the Dark Ember. I never turned those into Andre. I never needed them, but if you wanted to build a Divine plus 10 weapon or an Occult plus 5 weapon, you would have to give those to Andre and then follow the Divine upgrade path. You can look that up online and stuff if you're more confused on that, but if you've been following upgrading and kind of get the gist of it for like magic and fire, then you should get it for divine okay. And yeah, so prepare yourself for the final boss fight, which in this case I completely screw up because I have the wolf ring on and I decide, hey, you can actually parry and repost this boss. So I decided, hey, you know what, it's probably better if I use the Hornet Ring instead if I'm going to parry and repost. Which is totally kind of cheap for beating this boss because if you can parry him, he does a ton of damage. But if you can parry him, that's how you can beat him easily. So I basically just reset the fight here, reapply my buff. And on we go to fighting Gwyn, Lord of Cinder. So Gwyn, if you don't remember, was the Lord of Sunlight that he and his faithful knights challenged the dragons. He was the Lord of Lightning and all this other stuff. Really cool. He threw lightning bolts at dragons and peeled off their stone scales. It said that in the intro video. That's really cool stuff. He's basically the most powerful dude that 
ever existed. And he sacrificed himself to bolster or kindle the first flame so that his age of fire, where his gods, which would be his son and his daughter and the other gods, would all be worshipped. And he would also stop the rise of the age of man or the age of dark. And so he kindled the first flame, basically sacrificing himself, and he goes hollow. He himself falls victim to the same curse that he was trying to prevent. And mind you that he did this thousands of years ago, so the fire fades and he gets cursed. And so he becomes hollow and cursed with the very thing he tried to prevent, which he did. He basically postponed it for thousands of years. So in this final battle, it is your goal to defeat him and decide the fate of the world. Do you want to continue on his age where there's no curse, where everybody worships the gods and everything's all happy and peaceful, or do you potentially want a rise of mankind, a rise of man's rule? It might mean that there's a curse, or it might mean that somehow you embrace the curse, but in the end, mankind will overthrow the gods and you will essentially become the Dark Lord of Men. And those are your choices. So, think about maybe what you want to do while you're fighting him. What I'm trying to do right now in the battle is, you can see how aggressive he is, and his sword can hit through these stone pillars around the room. So what I'm trying to do is show you his grab attack that does really good damage but every time I get healed up and ready to get grabbed I either dodge his grab like this and I should have let him grab me or I get hit and then he tries to grab me when I'm too low of health so this next kind of thing is just cat and mouse I'm playing with him a little bit trying to show his grab attack I don't want to repost him right now because if I do then he's dead but I also don't want to die, because it's a long run back here, and I'm recording this, so I would have to trim a video if that were the case. Luckily, I don't die. But it gets close a couple times because of how much damage he does. In New Game Plus, like, 3 or 4, or, you know, even higher than that, you can go up to New Game Plus 7, which is your 8th game cycle. I think that's when this game maxes out. That's when Dark Souls 2 and 3 max out. He is just insanely difficult. Just because of how much damage he does. Think about this, but like eight game cycles higher where he's getting stronger and you're supposed to be getting stronger. But the enemies are basically just stronger than you. So, yeah. It's going to be pretty intense if you get a character up there. Pretty crazy. So anyway, a lot of this is just me dodging, trying to show you maybe how to dodge and when to attack. Honestly, I don't really do a very good job at that. I just am trying to stay alive enough so that he'll grab me, do some damage, and then I can go ahead and kill him after that. I don't want to die from his grab though, so just trying to keep as much health as I can. But you can see he swung right through the pillar, and before I could really recover from my own healing, he started a stab, and that hit me before I was really ready. So, honestly, fighting him normally without parrying him is going to be pretty difficult. Unless you have a heavy weapon, you might be able to break his poise and stagger him. But parrying is a pretty easy method once you get it down. I'm not trying to parry, obviously. but you can just kind of see. So, in the next game cycle, you can, uh... Well, here's his grab attack. You can see how much damage that does to me now. And he follows it up with some amazing jumping attacks, which if you don't dodge that right, you're dead. I mean, pretty much. At least I'm dead. So, at the end of this battle, you're gonna get his soul. It's a boss soul. And you can make his sword with it, 
You can also buy his armor from the exotic armor salesman dude. And um, you can also make Sunlight Spear, which is a really strong version of Lightning Spear. It requires super high faith, but you can also make that with his soul. But we have it here. It tells you a little bit about it. It says he linked the first flame. Um, he gave most of his power away to other gods and stuff, but um, even then he had enough power to kindle the first flame. And then on top of that, it's still immensely powerful. So he is just like the strongest dude ever, and you just beat him. I mean, back in his prime, he probably would have owned you, but he is a lot weaker now because of that. So at this point, here are the two options. I explained them a little bit during the fight. You can walk out of the room, you can go that way, and you'll get the dark ending where you become the Dark Lord of Man. Or you can come over to the fire here and link the first flame and continue the progression. So that's what we're going to do because that seems like the most fitting for what we've done. This is what Frampt wants. We sided with Frampt. And so we are going to do the quote-unquote good ending of the game. Well, congrats guys on beating Dark Souls, especially the Prepare to Die edition of the game, which is with the extra hard DLC and everything that's supposed to be, you know, super difficult, and you did it. You have beaten one of the hardest, more recent games to come out. It's uh, pretty exciting. I'm going to skip the credits for now just to show you that you pick up immediately. This is New Game Plus. Looks like nothing's changed. You have all your health, all your armor, the same amount of flasks that you had before, and everything. You're back in your cell. So, what's next in this video is going to be a little bit of recap for Dark Souls 1, what you did what it all means, and what you can expect from Dark Souls 2, assuming that is your next game that you're going into, and maybe a little bit about Dark Souls 3. Just a little bit, just in case you don't play 2. Alright, so what does it mean to beat Dark Souls? What exactly did you accomplish? You're not quite sure. There was a little bit of story that I would mention throughout the game, throughout this walkthrough video, but... For the most part, it doesn't all make sense still. And that's the beauty of the game, is that this stuff is really deep. The game intertwines with itself, and layers upon layers upon layers just mash all together, and you're supposed to figure out what it all means. Luckily, there's a lot of people out there that have their own theories, there are people that have made YouTube videos, and there's just tons and tons of ideas that people have that they've gotten from various item descriptions and what they feel like they accomplished in their playthrough of the game. What I'm gonna explain is probably the most common or the most popular theory of the game, but the beauty of it really comes down to just what you think your ultimate goal was in the game. So there's no right or wrong answer, there are just some tidbits of detail that we know about the game, and from there you can draw your own conclusions. I will maybe pull up some stuff that isn't quite proven. I'm not going to prove all the theories, because other people have, but I guess this is sort of my take on the game and what I think we just accomplished. So, in the beginning, the narrator describes the world being gray trees, gray fog, gray everything, and everlasting dragons that reign over the planet. But then, all of a sudden, for some reason, we don't know why entirely, 
there was a first flame. In this first flame, there were four Lord Souls found, and there were four people that received these souls. There was Nito, the first of the dead, the skeleton dude, who reigns over death and everything that is dead. He's basically the underworld guardian dude. Then you had the Witch of Isolith and the Daughters of Chaos, who used fire and pyromancy, really fire sorcery before pyromancy was around. Then you have Gwyn and his faithful knights. Gwyn was the Lord of Sunlight and a Master of Lightning. And then you had the Furtive Pygmy, which was so easily forgotten, is all the narrator says. The first three were the only ones that really mattered in the base game. And so Nito, the Witch of Isolith, and Gwyn came up with a plan to take down the Everlasting Dragons when they found out about another dragon that would help them out in their war if they would just grant him a little bit of power and a place to research his quest for immortality. That was Seath the Scaleless. So after the war with the dragons, the lords kind of went their own separate ways. Nito went to the Tomb of the Giants, which I don't necessarily know where the Tomb of the Giants was. Maybe those were fallen soldiers in battle, like giant archers or whatever, and so there's giant skeletons and other skeletons. Maybe he rounded up the dead and put them all somewhere to bury them properly, and watch over them in their afterlife and make sure nobody comes and messes with them. The Witch of Isolith went on to build her own city, which is called Lost Isolith in the game, but it was probably just called Isolith back then. It was filled with citizens and everything. Seat the Scaleless was granted dukedom by Gwyn, and Gwyn bequeathed a piece of his own soul to Seath, so that Seath could have his new power to go seek immortality, and Gwyn also gave him his own little place to research on his own without being bothered. And Gwyn made an Orlando, and he had kids, his son Gwendolyn and his daughter Guinevere, and they were all there, and everything was fine, it was the Age of Fire now. So at some point in the future, the first flame started to die down and was unable to sustain itself. And there were a couple different solutions to try and stop this. One was the Witch of Isolith. She said, oh, you know, I know my magic. I know fire. Let me try and use this soul I got from the first flame to make another flame that will burn just as bright, just as long, and maybe give more souls or whatever, and we can continue the Age of Fire. Well, she attempted to do that and ended up failing and creating the Chaos Flame and the Demons, which is why we have the Taurus Demon and the Capra Demon, and basically every other demon in the game is because of that. The Bed of Chaos is the Chaos Flame, that was created and pyromancy was actually created to kind of use the chaos flame so after the witch's attempt fails Gwyn decides that the best decision is to fuel the flame and since they took powerful souls from the first flame they kind of have to give the souls back sort of so other than Nito and the witch Gwyn had his soul, but he gave a piece to Seath, and he gave some to the four kings in New Londo, and then he went and sacrificed himself to keep the Age of Fire going. This was important to him because, remember, that when the fire fades, there's a curse, an undead curse. People are coming back to life, they're not dying. And for whatever reason, be it that the humans are becoming immortal and becoming stronger, or they're just afraid of change, they decide to continue the Age of Fire and prolong that so that they can remain in power. This is where the Primordial Serpents come in. 
The one on the left is King Seeker Frampt, and he is tasked with trying to find a successor to Lord Gwyn so that that successor can feed the fire, link the fire, and continue the Age of Fire so that the gods can basically remain in power. He's the quote-unquote good guy to deal with. The other one is Darkstalker Koth, and he has his own agenda where he's deciding that instead of continuing the Age of Fire, let the fire fade away and let humans rise into power. Let them become the Dark Lord, and they can basically be as powerful as the gods at this point. He's considered to be the bad ending, if you want to call it that, because the game kind of shifts into this focus that the curse is evil, and that you're supposed to cure it, and if you don't cure it, you're selfish and you're bad. But what's so threatening about humans, and why are they to fear? What's this power of the Dark Lord that the gods are fearing? Well, that comes down to the Furtive Pygmy. Now remember, in the base game, they made us focus on Gwyn, the Witch of Izalith, Seat the Scaleless, and Nito. Those were like the four really important people that you had to go kill. Well, the Furtive Pygmy found his own Lord Soul within the first flame, and he was completely forgotten about. That's what the narrator says. He was so easily forgotten. He found a Lord Soul which is really powerful still. Koth will tell you that the progenitor of humanity is the furtive pygmy, and that when the pygmy found his soul, he found it to be unique and different from the others. It was the dark soul. The pygmy decided that he would wait until the fire would fade, and then the dark soul would be powerful, and you would usher in an age of dark, or the age of humanity. And at some point, the fire was dying down, and humanity was starting to rise and gain power. And Gwyn decided that instead of allowing that to happen, he would sacrifice himself and continue the Age of Fire. The Pygmy knew that he wouldn't be able to have his Dark Age anytime soon as long as the gods remained and kept stopping it. So he split his Dark Soul up into multiple fragments and spread it across humans. Those little pieces of his soul become humanity, and humanity can grow and expand and shrink over time. It can adapt to situations. So humans can get more humanity, less humanity, depending on the actions that they take. This basically means that the Dark Soul never dies, and that it can never really be stopped, and eventually when the fire fades, the Dark Soul will start to thrive. Humanity will be the only thing really left, and it will grow and expand and never cease to exist. But as long as the gods are around, they're not gonna let the fire fade. As long as somebody is there to make sure that the gods stay in power, humanity will never become a threatening thing. It will never have a Dark Lord. It will never rise to power. And that was Framp's job. He decided, hey, I'm going to stop people from even knowing about humanity and humans and their rise to power and instead say that the only way to cure the curse is to link the fire. In fact, you could kind of think of the curse as not a curse, but really it's humanity's power trying to show again. So people are dying and they're coming back to life as undead, but that can be a power, not a curse, but it's twisted to kind of look like it's a curse so that humans will want to get rid of it and and not even know about their true potential. Of course, Koth doesn't like that idea, so he sets out to change that. This is when the events of the DLC start to happen. So a while after the furtive pygmy dies, Koth goes to Ulasil and tells this thriving city that what they should do if they wanted to discover new power or whatever is to go ahead and dig up primeval man's grave which is the pygmy and the pygmy and his soul are still kind of intact the pygmy obviously didn't get rid of all of his soul he kept part of it 
and I guess it was still powerful enough to sustain him, so maybe he didn't really die, or maybe it brought him back to life, because that's what the dark does. It, you know, makes you undead. And so when they did this, the soul went active. It basically reawakened him as his true form, which was Manus, father of the abyss. Manus is actually so powerful that instead of them being able to use his soul for their needs, his soul ends up corrupting them, and that's why the people of Ulisil have the weird bloated heads and red eyes and everything like that. Basically, that's just humanity gone rampant and trying to power up into its ultimate form, which is pretty much Manus. So in a sense, the Dark Lord of Humanity could actually become Manus or stronger. I'm not certain if Gwyn has sacrificed himself at this point or not, but it doesn't really matter because humanity, the dark, and everything is starting to spread, which is totally against what the gods want. So Gwyn's knights, whether or not Gwyn's still around, still follow An Orlando and their rules and Guinevere and Gwendolyn are still in An Orlando and want to follow their father's rule. So basically, the knights set out to stop the spreading of the abyss, except for one, that's Ornstein, or Ornstein, you can pronounce it, and he stays to protect Guinevere. Artorius specifically was the one tasked with actually ending the abyss and stopping it, and so he had to make a pact so that he could traverse the abyss safely, since the abyss is not a place for anybody who's not basically changing into humanity's raw form. Hawkeye, Goff, and Kirin are following Artorius, and they basically accompany him on his journey, but Artorius was really the only one that could fight the abyss, and remember, the Abyss is like emanating from Menis, who is the primeval man, the founder of the Dark Soul. So basically, the thought was, if you can kill Menis, if you can stop the Abyss, then humanity will weaken and will follow the gods again. So basically, only Artorius could do this task, and the other two just kind of followed him, tried to protect him, or whatever. The Abyss was so strong, though, that Artorius was actually corrupted himself, even though he tried to find ways around it to make a pact so that he wouldn't succumb to the Abyss, but in the end, he was devoured by it anyway. So you end up in the DLC way back in their time period. You were dragged off to the past because Manus' power was so strong that apparently it can jump between times and he grabbed you. You had a broken pendant, which apparently he really cared for or something that was especially important to him. So you're dragged off to the past and you basically stumble across this whole thing. Artorius is corrupted, Ulysil has fallen apart, and nobody else can really do anything about it. So, you kind of start taking Artorius's place to stop Manus and the spreading of the Abyss. Maybe not necessarily because you believe it's the right thing to do, but maybe you think that's your only way out of here. Or whatever the case is, you're dragged off to the past and it's causing trouble, somebody needs to stop it, otherwise the Abyss will consume the world. And so you do, you defeat Manus, and by doing that, you stop the spreading of the Abyss. But you don't end the Abyss altogether. It exists, it's spread, it's consumed part of the land, and it is basically just buried at that point. At this point, Koth's plan has failed. Humanity wasn't able to usher in an Age of Dark, it was stopped, and Manus was put to rest, his soul was taken, and basically Manus couldn't return. Not that his soul couldn't maybe spread and split into humanity and grow, or anything like that, but it's not able to revive Manus anymore. So basically, Framp succeeds, and Koth fails, and... Koth decides to go ahead and try and find another way so that he can usher in an Age of Dark for humanity, 
and he goes to New Londo and talks to the Four Kings, which, if you remember, you receive a shard of Gwyn's soul from them when you defeat them. It's because Gwyn gave a piece of his soul to those four kings so that they could rule over New Londo and basically run things the way that they see fit because they were good kings and Gwyn trusted them. So Koth comes along and basically corrupts those four kings. He tells them, hey, you know, humanity can be a lot stronger if you just learn the art of life drain which is the ability to steal humanity from other humans, you can grow stronger yourself and find this new power and be even more powerful than the gods. And so the four kings were corrupted and they basically fall to the abyss and do this life drain thing. And they also sort of start a dark wraith group, or at least Koth starts the dark wraith group and they're part of it, maybe a you know, leader of the group, and those people are dedicated to ushering in an Age of Dark and basically absorbing as much humanity as they can to help spread the Abyss. So let's kind of rewind a little bit now that we've got the DLC covered and we've kind of got the story of the Four Kings and this whole Dark thing. When you start the game, you are told that there's a bell of awakening that you need to ring and that will help you basically find your purpose. Why are you undead? Why do undead exist? And there's got to be something more, a reason why that the undead curse happens. So this bell of awakening is your quest in the beginning. Once you make it out of the asylum where you're imprisoned, you will meet the Crestfallen Warrior guy here, and he tells you that there's actually two Bells of Awakening, and that they're almost impossible to get to. So, he pretty much gives up on the quest right there, but he tries to help you a little bit by telling you what he knows. There are lots of obstacles in your way to get to these Bells of Awakening. There's a big red drake that's flying around, there are a couple different demons that are much stronger than you, and there are other things that are in your way, and Blight Town has been overrun with the curse as well, and so you've got people that have gone crazy, and it's a poison-filled swamp, and it's just a mess, and it's pretty hard to get to the other Bell of Awakening. But you decide anyway that you're going to seek this quest and that you're going to undertake the task no matter what happens. So you go ahead and you go ring your first Bell of Awakening, which is up in Undead Parish with the Gargoyles. And you defeat them and you ring that bell, nothing happens. But you're told that the other one is below in Blight Town, so you figure out a way to get down there and you get to the end of Blight Town, and you have to fight Chaos Witch Quaylag, who's only really there protecting the entrance to Lost Isolith and protecting her sister, but you don't know that. She's also in the way of your Bell of Awakening, and she doesn't know that, so you end up having to fight her and defeat her as well. Remember, another interesting tidbit about her and why she's all spidery is because the Witch of Isolith tried to create the first flame and created demons, and the witch and everybody was affected. Once you've defeated Quaylag, Kingseeker Frampt wakes up and he tells you that you need to go through Sen's Fortress to get to Anorlando. And Sen's Fortress is filled with traps and has deadly obstacles ahead and is another checkpoint to get into Anorlando. But you get through there, you defeat the Iron Golem, and then you are taken to Anorlando to get the Lord Vessel. And Orlando is designed specifically to be locked up and protect Guinevere and Gwendolyn from any and all harm, so it's not very easy to go through. You have to find ways into the castle that you wouldn't normally have to do if it was open. But you make it in there anyway, and you eventually get up to Guinevere, but not before getting past her guards, Ornstein and Smo, who are pretty much duty-bound to protect her. So this whole time, you've been led by Frampt to go get the Lord Vessel, 
and he wants you to place it on Firelink Altar with him so that you can go fulfill the Age of Fire thing. If instead you venture down to New Londo and try to explore down there once you have the Lord Vessel, you'll find that New Londo has been flooded in order to stop Koth and the Dark Wraiths from expanding the Abyss. But since only the Chosen One is given the Lord Vessel, and the Chosen One is tasked with defeating the Four Kings and getting Gwyn's soul so that they can fill the Lord Vessel and unlock the way to Gwyn to link the fire, the Sealer guy down there decides to give you the key to the seal to open up the area so that you can defeat Four Kings, get the soul, and fulfill your destiny. And when you defeat Four Kings, you'll notice that Darkstalker Koth is down there if you haven't placed the Lord Vessel with Framped yet. He basically is now free to explore. He tells you your destiny of being the Dark Lord if you side with him and you can place it with him. This upsets Framped because Framped believes that the person who's going to rule can never become the Dark Lord and instead will have to succeed Gwyn in Link the Fire. Regardless of who you choose, you are tasked with finding the other Lord Souls. If you've placed it with Framped, he'll tell you to kill four kings. If you place it with Koth, you've already defeated four kings. And so you are still tasked with getting Seath, Nido, and the Witch of Isolith taken care of. Only their souls will be strong enough to power the Lord Vessel up so that it can open the seal to the Kiln of the First Flame where Gwyn is where ultimately you make the decision of becoming the Dark Lord or linking the fire and expanding the Age of Fire. Now, there's a lot more story between a lot of the optional bosses that I haven't covered yet, and they have really in-depth stories that ties to everything. Those bosses would be ones like the Demon Fire Sage and Priscilla and the Centipede Demon, Ceaseless Discharge, and any other optional boss that we did fight, but I really haven't talked about in depth in this video. So after you've defeated the Witch, or the Bed of Chaos, which is the Witch's soul, and you've defeated Seath and gotten the soul shard that Gwyn gave him, and you defeated Nito and gotten Nito's soul, and the one from the Four Kings, that makes enough so that you can go fight Gwyn who has sealed himself away and is basically waiting for the next successor. He's hoping that by telling Framped to find somebody to succeed him and continue the Age of Fire, that Gwyn's kids Guinevere and Gwendolyn and the other lords will be able to continue and rule over the land since he sacrifices himself and can't do anything about it after that. So after you defeat Gwyn, you're given the choice of linking the fire, which is shown on the left, and that will continue the Age of Fire, or you can pick the other side on the right, which is the Dark Lord ending, and you'll find that there are more Primordial Serpents, not just Koth and Framped, and you become the true Dark Lord, and they serve you. So in theory, you're probably thinking, hey, so the game's over now, right? Like, you choose a side, you link the fire, everything's all back to normal, or you pick the dark side and everything is now dark and the fire's gone. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Remember, when Gwyn linked the fire, it faded again. That's why you have to do your journey to link it if you choose that side. If you choose dark, it's thought to be another cycle where the fire is still alive, it's just fading, and you're gaining power, and eventually somebody comes along and links the fire to stop the curse, whether it's Framped or somebody else telling them to go ahead and link the fire. They eventually find their way back to the fire, they link it, and it undoes the whole curse and you lose your power of the Dark Lord. Maybe they beat you, and so they're just stronger. The running idea is that it's an endless cycle. That no matter what you choose, somebody else is going to come along and is going to either link it or is going to turn away from it, and somebody else will come along and choose one of those options too. Eventually, 
the cycle will just keep continuing over time. Whether or not it ever ends is another story. Maybe the fire never fades away, or maybe it just can't get kindled anymore and can't be bolstered and eventually dark happens again. It's at this point where you kind of get the idea of phantoms and co-oping. They are other people that have gone through and done the same task. They're supposed to be heroes that have already done these things, like Black Iron Tarkus at Sen's Fortress was supposed to have gone up and fought the Iron Golem and lost. And so you can summon basically his spirit to help fight with you so that you can continue and you can succeed. So the idea is that all the phantoms you're seeing are other people since Solaire even says time is kind of overlapping that you could possibly see other people from other timelines and you can help each other out with their time. And so that's the idea of co-oping and phantoms and stuff, is that these are other people that are either in the future fighting these bosses or have already fought these bosses and are in a different time from your time. Maybe they succeeded, maybe they failed, whatever the case is, that's supposed to be the general idea. But if you consider that, that means that every boss that you actually defeat doesn't really die because somebody else might have already defeated them. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like the whole multiverse idea that there's, for every action you do, there's like a multiverse that's created where you didn't do the action. It's sort of like that. Like, you go fight Priscilla, somebody else went and fought her and lost, maybe somebody else didn't fight her, but their spirit is there to try and help you fight her if that's your choice. And it's just kind of this whole, like, intertwined dimension thing. And that's where things can get really confusing. But basically, the idea behind it all is that the cycle will go on for a long time, if not forever. So let's talk a little bit about what you can expect from Dark Souls 2 if you go to play that game after this one. Well, in my opinion, Dark Souls 2 is a fantastic game. It's personally my favorite in the series. Maybe not for the boss fights. I will mention that I felt a lot of the boss fights were very similar. And, you know, going back and playing those bosses now, certainly they're not that exciting. But I feel like the story and the atmosphere of the game is great. I feel like the combat is great. I feel like everything about it is pretty good. When it comes to PvP, Dark Souls 2, in my opinion, feels really balanced. There aren't any classes that I feel like overpower any other class. Everything can be dodged. Everything can be blocked. There are easy counters to every class. It just comes down to player skill at that point. But it's not like magic is super slow, so it's almost useless in combat. It has uses, and pure sorcerer builds can actually become really good PvP characters if your opponent doesn't really know how to dodge your spells. The downside to PvP, I think, is that the covenants are a little weird. The PvP covenants specifically require you to get a lot of wins in tournaments or in arenas against other people, and sometimes that counts against you, or sometimes you need an item to even enter the tournament, and then you may lose, and you need like 500 wins to rank up max with it. It's pretty extreme, and I think for the average Dark Souls player, it's way out of their league to just go ahead and rank up that high. They're probably not going to reach that. I know I didn't reach it, but that's because I didn't focus on the arenas. The good thing about PvP is that there are arenas and you can do fair duels versus another player where healing is limited and spells and skills are limited, there's no other outside interaction, there's no extra phantoms that the host is summoned in that could come and kill you, there's no more healing that the host has that the invader doesn't, there's really nothing too unbalanced, at least from my experience of the game. Overall PvP I find to be pretty balanced too, because if you have an invader the host can summon phantoms, and if 
the host can't summon a phantom, like there aren't any around, there's actually items to turn the area enemies on against the invader, so that the host and the invader can be on equal footing. The invader can't hide between all your enemies and just wait for you in the worst spot, they'll also get attacked by the enemies. So it really balances things out. In terms of playing the actual game, I feel like it's best to get the Scholar of the First Sin edition if you can. That includes all the DLC and has a couple extra features, and it's slightly changed from the base Dark Souls 2 game, but all in pretty good ways, I'd say. In addition to that, the base game, Dark Souls 2, has been updated to be very similar to Scholar of the First Sin. There's not like, one version lets you farm things easier, one version lets you do this easier. Typically, they're about the same. The tricky thing about Dark Souls 2, though, is that there was a base game, and then there was Scout of the First Sin, which was like a next-gen release of the game. And because there's online interaction, there's actually two different groups. There's people that play on Dark Souls 2, and then there's people that play on Scout of the First Sin. So if you're trying to get the game to play the game with somebody else, make sure you both get the same version. I prefer Scout of the First Sin over the base game, but it doesn't really matter. The only thing might be is that Scout of the First Sin might be supported a little bit longer since it was released as a next-gen version, so they might support it a little bit longer. But now that Dark Souls 3 is out, the support for either game is about the same. In terms of actually the game itself, the bosses and everything, they should all be the same, doesn't matter which one you choose. Um, I like a lot of the bosses in the game, but really more the end game bosses. And I can say the same thing about Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 3. So I don't really feel like the bosses are any better or worse except for maybe some combat things, like a lot of the bosses in Dark Souls 2 are humanoid, so they're always going to have like a hammer or a mace or maybe they're just a giant thing and they can use their hand instead. They're going to be focusing on basically you versus a giant enemy that's human-like with a weapon and you're going to have to dodge those attacks. Dark Souls 1 has a little more variety with beasts and monsters instead of more humanoid things, but I still think Dark Souls 2 is really fun for its bosses, even if they are mostly humanoid. The story of Dark Souls 2 is very similar to Dark Souls 1, but not a copy by any means. Basically, you're going to wake up in a kingdom, a land, that has fallen apart just like an Orlando and all of the Lordran area and New Londo and all of that. You're gonna wake up in an area just like that where everything's fallen apart, it's in disarray, there are hollow people running around and you've got this curse and you don't know how to fix the curse. You're being guided slightly towards a goal with a king. It says, go meet this king, he has the answers you seek so you have to get to his castle. It's actually kind of a reverse version of Dark Souls 1. In Dark Souls 1, they put you on a very linear path in the beginning. They said, go here, go here, go here, go here. Then once you've done that, you split and you could do any of the four lords that you wanted or even the DLC. With Dark Souls 2, it's kind of the reverse where it's, they say, hey, you need to get these lord souls now so that you can even get to the king. So it's kind of like getting the Lord Souls, then seeing Gwyn, and then Gwyn has the answers you need to cure yourself. This is sort of the case. You'll find out that it's a lot more complicated than that, but I think it's a pretty cool story that way too. Dark Souls 2 focuses a lot on Dark Souls 1's DLC. Its story kind of comes with the understanding that you know kind of what the first one's DLC was about, which is why I spent so much time explaining the whole dark thing in this video. Basically, in this game, Manus's soul was fragmented into multiple pieces at some point, and those pieces 
are out trying to gain more power and they are causing chaos and destruction across the land. They take forms as certain attributes of menace. One might be happiness, one might be sadness, one might be anger, one might be fear. Those forms are out and they appear human to you and they cling to things so that they can get power. Much like Dark Souls 1, you're going to be traveling to other kingdoms and you're going to see the impact that humanity and the Dark Soul has on those kingdoms. One kingdom might be affected by the Shard of Fear and so maybe the citizens are more scared, maybe the king is more scared and he doesn't live up to his potential and his kingdom ends up falling apart some way. Maybe the one for anger is out there and it's just strong enough that it can destroy an entire kingdom by itself. That's going to be up to you and your interpretation of Dark Souls 2. I think it's a really cool story and it's really in depth. A few other things about Dark Souls 2. Obviously being a sequel, you're going to have a lot of callbacks to Dark Souls 1. So it's pretty awesome when you get an item or find a covenant that is just like the one in one, maybe slightly different, but the same general idea. An example of this is the Warriors of Sunlight. They're a group again in Dark Souls 2, and they have their own covenant, and to join it you'll find the same statue that you had to kneel to in Dark Souls 1 to join in Dark Souls 2. But the game is not an exact copy, it's not even completely similar. You're going to have callbacks, you're going to have weapons and stuff that you recognize, but it's different enough that when you play the game, you're going to be like, oh, I remember that item, but it's not going to be the exact same group of people. You're not going to run into the same NPCs that you did in one. They're just not going to be around. Dark Souls 2 also makes improvements to Dark Souls 1 in terms of combat and magic. I explained this a little bit. Um, basically, in combat, I feel like combat's a lot more fluid, but in addition to that, dual wielding weapons is a lot more beneficial. You can now dual wield a mace and a sword together and get a unique moveset for that pairing. You can pair a scimitar and a sword together, or a scimitar and maybe a dagger. Not all weapon combinations work, but dual wielding is a lot more fun. You could have two spears or two giant clubs or something that you dual wield, and when you do that, they get a unique moveset to that kind of weapon class. Basically, it means that when you're dual wielding, it's not always the same as like in one where it's like, hey, I put a sword in my left hand and I put a sword in my right hand and they swing exactly the same. It's just that one's in my left hand and one's in my right hand. In Dark Souls 2, you have the ability to keep that or also build a character so that you can do what they call power stancing, which allows you to do twin attacks with those weapons like I was trying to explain you might have two swords and you swing both swords at the same time at an enemy. It might cost more stamina, but you'll do more damage that way. But it's not just melee weapons that have been overhauled for combat. They also added a new form of magic called hexing, which is magic based off of both your intelligence and your faith. There are spells that are designed for hexing for just intelligence, there are spells for hexing just on the miracle side, and then there are ones that are somewhere in between. They all require a decent amount of intelligence or a decent amount of faith to use. You might have one that's like 18 intelligence and one that's 42 faith, so it's obviously more of a faith-sided hex. It does dark damage, not to be confused with the dark damage in one, this is actually a separate element and separate damage stat. Just like fire and lightning, those are actually a new element that you can throw into the game and now you have things that are resistant to dark or are weak to dark or whatever. These hexes are brand new and offer new forms of magic. There's dark orb instead of soul arrow. 
and there's also new things that you can do with those. And it's not just the hexing that's been added, they've also changed miracles, sorceries, and pyromancies to kind of fit this new hexing thing so that they're all dynamic and they all have a very similar thing. There's area of effects for sorcery, pyromancy, miracles, and hexes so that everybody gets a chance. And there are various spells that are very similar to one another in each class so that not one class tends to be more overpowered than the other. People will argue that hexing is really cheap, that it does a lot of damage, and they're sort of right. It's hard to have high dark defense in Dark Souls 2 as a player against another player, but you can certainly do it, and if you're running across a lot of people using it, then you can build a character to kind of be anti-hexing. And there are lots of spells and rings and class builds that are designed to combat clerics and pyromancers and sorcerers and hexers, not all at once, but the character creation is more specific. It's kind of great that you can build a super strong hexer and that there's somebody out there that knows your weakness and can exploit it. And if you wanted to be an archer character, in Dark Souls 2 they gave a little bit more love to archers. The bows fire a little bit faster and they can zoom in and stuff a lot faster. It's more designed for, again, dynamic combat. You can roll and then after your roll you can place a shot a lot quicker than you can in the first game. And so you can have times where you're drawing your bow pretty fast and you can have times where maybe you draw a slower bow so that you do a higher damage shot. It really depends just on what kind of weapons you use and how you want to play the game. So even if you've heard that Dark Souls 2 isn't Dark Souls 1 and that it failed, some people will argue that it's the worst game in existence, I suggest that you give it a shot that you try it and you play it, you might find that you really like the game. Because if you play 2 and you beat 2 and then you go to 3 or you go back to 1, I think you're going to notice some things that Dark Souls 2 does that 1 and 3 don't do that you're going to miss. And so it's not a complete failure of a game. If you can't play it, maybe it's too expensive or whatever the case is, definitely watch somebody play it probably an in-depth walkthrough. I already have one up at this point, but I'm not going to ask you to go watch my walkthrough. I don't think it really matters too much who you watch, just so long that you watch at least part of it. And I'd say get through most of a walkthrough. Don't just watch like the first few videos because the beginning areas of the game could be pretty boring, but it's near the end where things pick up. It's an extremely long game. I think I had 20 some videos versus 15 for Dark Souls 1, and that includes the three DLCs that are added in Dark Souls 2 versus the one in Dark Souls 1. So it's definitely a long game. If anything, maybe at least watch some people online talk about the story of the game because i feel like dark souls 2 really capitalizes on a fantastic story and even if you don't like the game the story of it is pretty cool so congrats guys on your first successful playthrough of dark souls 1 fantastic job that's a very tough game for new people to play I hope that you go on to Dark Souls 2 and Dark Souls 3, and I hope my videos were helpful. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you guys in another game.